and welcome to the Ag Committee, Janet Ag Committee. It's Wednesday, January 24th, uh, which is uh, my son's birthday today. Oh, uh, birthday. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I always remember that day pretty well. <laughs> uh, and uh, so we have a group of folks here uh, to talk about uh, food security and how that's all going. And uh, we'll, we'll run, a, the committee will introduce ourselves and then we'll call on you folks. And uh, I don't know, uh, we've got that, uh, we've got an order, but if that doesn't fit your schedule for any reason, we might uh, send your hands. Yep, Brian Collum, or representing the Rutland District. Irene Runner, Senator Fortune in North, which includes Fairfax. This is Brian Campion from Denny. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Rich Westman, and I'm the Senator from Little Wyoming. And Bobby Starr from Orleans County. So, um, <clears throat> welcome, uh, uh, welcome all of you to the committee. We, <clears throat> we've got plenty of time this morning, so everybody should be uh, able to be heard. Um, is there any particular order that you'd like to go in? Uh, in I, oh? Yep, I'll be, um, good morning. Um, I will be uh, emceeing our our presentation today. So I'll, st I'll give a start and then I'll call on whoever is next. Yeah, that uh, sounds like a plan. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Um, my name is Becca Warren. I live in Heartland and I work at the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund. I'm the Farm to Plate Network Food Security Project Manager. And I'm here with other Farm to Plate staff and Farm to Plate members. Um, I wish I was there in person to demonstrate how we are bursting at the seams with excitement to bring you the Vermont Food Security Roadmap to 2035, which I see Jake passed out. Thank you, Jake. Um, so the roadmap charts the path for the state of Vermont to make policy choices that will ensure food security for everyone who lives here by 2035, to ensure everyone in Vermont has the food they need every day. And we are particularly glad to share our excitement with the Senate Committee on Agriculture today. It was your decision to create the Farm to Plate Network 13 years ago that has built the partnerships and strategies that led to this food security roadmap and will lead to food security by 2035. Sorry. The Vermont State, the Vermont Farm to Plate Strategic Plan directed us to improve access to healthy local food for everyone by creating a detailed implementable roadmap to food security. We have spent two years developing this document and surprised ourselves with how powerful and impactful a roadmap we made so it's your farm to plate vision that has led to a powerful coalition committed to working with you to achieve this transformational plan. And today we will give an overview of the roadmap. You'll hear from organizations about their commitment to executing the roadmap. And we'll share how our collective action is successful because the state took leadership on food security. So we'll start with testimony from Anor Horton of Hunger Free Vermont, who's in the room. Joey LaHoulier of Footbrook Farm, who's on Zoom, and Monica Collins of Feeding the Valley, who's also on Zoom. Then I'll come back and give a bit of detail and a walkthrough of the roadmap document. And then we'll hear from Abby Willard and Stephanie Bergen about the commitment of the Agency of Agriculture and Department of Health. I do respectfully request that we wait for questions until we've finished our prepared testimony. We've timed our presentation, so we have ample time for discussion, and we're really looking forward to that. So as I said, the roadmap shows us how to ensure everyone in Vermont has the food they need and is organized under three goals that we will achieve by 2035. The goals and the objectives and strategies they contain are based on the expertise of over 600 people in Vermont who took the time to share their opinions, expertise, and personal knowledge of food security so the three goals we'll reach by 2035 are government ensures food security for all in Vermont. Vermont farms have the resources to be resilient. Communities have the tools 
to support food security. And Anor, Joey, and Monica are here to kick us off with how these goals are important to their work in the state. So Anor, can you, uh, are you ready to go? Sure. I'm sure. Ready to go. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, Becca, we, we don't operate like a lot of committees. We have short memories. <laughs> and uh, sometimes we we usually ask questions as we go through the witnesses. So, but I'd ask the members if you have questions, jot them down, and we'll we'll try to go by the rules that Becca has. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. what I'll call Becca. Okay. 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 Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Senators. It's so lovely to be back in the Senate Committee on Agriculture with you all. Thank you for having me this morning. I'm Anora Horton. I'm a resident of Williston, and I'm the Executive Director of Hunger Free Vermont. And I'm also a member of the steering committee that took those the, all that feedback from the 600 people from all around Vermont and, inter and expertise from a lot of different experts and um, has been part of the group that has turned all of that into the food security roadmap that you have in front of you today. And I'm also here today as a founding member of the Mass Feeding Group. Um, and that was established by Vermont's SEOC in the early months of the COVID-19 pandemic when it became clear that the pandemic was also a hunger crisis, um, and really a hunger crisis that hasn't abated yet. And that food access and food security were not effectively woven into our emergency response systems in the state. That mass feeding group continues to this day as a place where state agencies and nonprofits that are together accountable for ensuring food security can keep in regular communication and strategize together. The value of the mass feeding group and the realization that the goal of food security is not consistently well integrated into government operations, that, that was something that led directly to my own personal passion for committing time over the last two years to help to create the Vermont Food Security Roadmap to 2035. And all of us are here today we're not here to like explain everything in that roadmap to you because that would take even longer than the generous amount of time that you've allowed us today. Um, but we're here to infuse you with the same passion that we all feel for creating a future of food security for everyone in Vermont. So every time that, that we got together as the steering committee to work on creating the food security roadmap, we paused and we tried to imagine what it would be like if we were actually standing in 2035 and we knew that everybody in Vermont had food security and climate resiliency and that our agricultural sector was thriving and providing for our people. And I invite everybody in this room right now to imagine that day. Imagine that hidden hunger does not exist in Vermont because everybody has the food we need. Imagine the possibilities available when nobody in Vermont is hungry. Imagine that we had all worked together in our mutually supporting roles to create permanent, equitable, Vermont-grown food security for all. How proud, how joyous, how fulfilled we would all feel to know that we had dedicated our lives and our work to achieving this outcome and that we had succeeded. And we are here today because we believe that this roadmap, if we follow it, we will actually succeed. We will actually achieve that amazing outcome in 2035. So the Vermont Food Security Roadmap leads with the goal that our government ensures food security for all in Vermont. And none of us would be here today, and you're certainly not shocked to see me here today, um, representing that goal. Um, but we would, none of us would be here in this room today if we didn't believe that food security is a policy choice that we can make. We know this is true. 
because of all of the policy choices that this committee and this legislature has already made and that have already put us on the road to food security in Vermont. So we're already on this road now. We're, we're on the road. Yeah. You created and funded the State Farm to School and Early Childhood Grants Program. You created and funded the Vermont Farm to Plate Network, as Becca said. You created and funded the Local Food Purchasing Incentive Program for our schools. You've begun supporting our Critical Meals on Wheels and Charitable Food Networks with base, with base funding and budget funding. You have made Vermont, my personal favorite, of course, the sixth state in the country to provide permanent universal school meals for all students in our public schools. You've supported Vermont farmers and, um, and Vermont producers in many innovative ways that other people in this room are more expert to remind you of than I am, but you know that you've done that. And in this current legislative session, we have a lot of new opportunities to hike down this road to food security and get to the next hut together. Uh, you can provide additional base funding for the Vermont Food Bank Network for, and for Meals on Wheels. You can provide funding to NOFA Vermont to support the Crop Cash Program. You can pass S215, uh, which is um, a bill that would launch the SNAP Restaurant Meals Program here in Vermont and move toward giving Three Squares Vermont a boost so food benefits are more adequate for more Vermont households. When it passes over to your side, you can pass what's now H701 to expand the Vermont Earned Income and Child Tax Credits. So lower income working families can keep more of what they earn and have that money available to create food security for themselves. You can support the Land Access and Opportunity Board and Working Lands. And those are just some of the key pieces of legislation and appropriations requests that are um, on the table and that um, are uh, directly contributing to taking us further down the path laid out in this roadmap. So you can see that our collective action has already begun and it is more necessary than ever. Um, food, people are struggling with hunger in Vermont. I know I need to tell you that because you talk to your constituents and you know that that's the case. And um, so, so we, it's more necessary than ever that we work together to ensure food security across Vermont. In times of crisis, as we had with the pandemic and with the flooding this past summer, and also times of calm, which I hope we get some of soon. We look forward to continuing our work together and we thank this committee for leading the way as you are doing now and as you always have. And I'm now going to hand things over to Joey Lugliere of Goodbrook Farm. Yeah. Thank you, Bert. <clears throat> Joey, I think it's going to be on the show. Hi, good Hi. morning, um, Senators. Thank, thank you also for letting me come and um, talk to you this morning. Um, the first thing, so if you don't know me, so Footbrook Farm, um, Johnson, Vermont, um, Tony and I um, run the farm, and we do about 30 acres of organic vegetables and fruit. Um, and we have a farm stand that is more run like a store from June to November. Um, we have it fully staffed seven days a week. Um, we also do wholesale through Deep Root, um, and we have some wholesale accounts in Vermont. Um, so that's us. Um, the first thing I, I want to say is when I read this roadmap, I was like, wow, this is amazing. If we could actually put this in place I would just, it would, it would just absolutely be amazing. And I really want to thank everyone that was involved in putting this together because it was obviously a tremendous amount of work and a lot of thought put into um, the problem with food security, but also the problems that farmers face and trying to, to make that happen. Um, I see every day at the farm stand, um, obviously when we're open, the challenges that my community has um, in getting food, especially 
since you all know that in July um, with the flood, the grocery store um, was flooded and went out of business and decided not to return. And since then, we had somebody interested in that location, but they, after the December flood, so we had the second worst flood and then the fourth worst flood in Johnson. Um, and after that December, I don't, I don't see, there's no, nobody that's interested in coming back to that spot as I understand it right now. So I became very important in my community um, for local whole vegetables and fruit. Um, we do have two convenience stores and a Dollar General, um, but those are not great for if we want people to eat super nutritionally. So um, one of the things in the roadmap talks about um, Vermont farms need the resources to be resilient. And some of those resources are are, sure. are through, um, you know, there's a NOFA farm match program and, you know, we accept SNAP and EBT at the farm stand and we have for many years, I want to say since 2016. Um, and then we've been part of the match program since 2019. And those programs are in, in the roadmap um, and they are essential for me being able to help um, make sure that our, our community that has a very low budget for food can come into the farm stand and feel like they have the resources to buy it. Um, so in the short term, um, you can fund, there's $478,000 that's being asked um, to put that into the budget that will help fund that program. Um, that's the short term. And if you can help make that happen, that will help us immensely um, to be able to get, you know, anybody that walks into the farm stand right now, whether they have the, the money on their EBT card or their debit cards or in their pocket, um, nobody walks out of this that farm stand without food, um, whether they can pay for it or not. Um, but <clears throat> as a business, as you might, as you know, I need to be sustainable so that I can take care of my employees. Um, during the flood, right after the flood, um, of course, having it be in July is like the worst time. Every farmer will tell you, worst time to have something happen because you're just about to harvest. You're just about to make back all the money that you just invested into your season. Um, so one of the things in the roadmap is, um, you know, making sure that we're resilient and that there's an emergency fund available. Um, had we not had our community and our um, people in a GoFundMe, um, I would have had to have laid, laid off all our employees within two weeks. I, I didn't, it was, again, worst time of the year to have a flood. So um, this roadmap is something that really could keep us in business because we would have, we would have had to send everybody home. So just th there's some things in this roadmap that are hugely important. Um, Tony and I, as the farm, and as a business, we have the responsibility to be ready for the next weather event. And we're putting a lot of things in place to make sure that that happens. Um, but we really could use some extra help to make sure that the next thing that inevitably will probably happen that we're that we're ready for and that we can count on on you to to help get us through it. And like the like the roadmap says, um, Vermont farms need the resources to be resilient. Um, so thank you very much for letting me speak today and considering putting this roadmap into action. Um, thank, thank you, uh, Joey. Where is your farm located? It's in Johnson, Vermont. South, uh, south of Johnson or? Um, we're actually just um, west of the village. So we're in Lamoille County. Yep. On the river, did you flood out? Did you lose everything? Yes. Yeah, we, so all of our, we lost about, I think we're still trying to figure all of that out, but we lost at least 75% of our crops, which is devastating all by itself. But our biggest problem was that um, the flood came into our equipment shed. So we had 13 tractors underwater. And we have five feet of water in our barn. Um, what I can tell you is that 
we we're going to be moving that equipment shed as soon as we possibly can. <laughs> and we also had we had we known what that flood was going to do, we would have moved the equipment. Um, the the things that are in place to give us, you know, an idea of how much flooding we're going to see, the NOAA sites and all that were really not, they were so wrong for that particular event. Um, but we will not just be counting on that next time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Joey, can you just be a little more specific about what are the things that you are going to do looking ahead to sort of get ready for the next event? You mentioned moving the shed. Is there Are there other things that you're contemplating? <clears throat> well, we're contemplating a lot of things. Some we do have, so most farmers will tell you that floodplain soils are the best to grow in. Oh. Trying to convince my husband not to grow on, you know, we don't grow within a quarter of a mile of the river. Um, and we have, you know, we've worked with NRCS and everybody, we have a wonderful um, uh, bank. We have all the proper bushes and trees and everything that are protecting it. Um, so we don't grow down by the river, but we are definitely trying to get some soils that are, we have a couple of higher up fields. Um, so we're trying really hard to get those soils ready so we can plant more uphill. Um, and also just, um, yeah, move stuff around the best we can as far as the crops go. But again, crops are something that you can you can lose every year to all kinds of different things. And we can be pretty resilient with that because we're, we're really diversified. Um, but moving the equipment, making sure that we move the equipment no matter what that flood um, is saying it's gonna be, um, is gonna be huge. And also protecting our barn. Um, we're gonna do some things, put more things up higher, um, put pallets, you know, we'll just be way more ready for the next one than, than we were this time. Um, had we known it was gonna rise to, I think it 21, 22, 23 feet, um, we would have understood where the water was going to go, but we just we didn't have that kind of um, that kind of information. So we're going to put our own cameras and all kinds of different things around so that we can see what's happening um, for the next event. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Joey. Thank you. Who's up next? Uh, I'm up next. Uh, good morning. Um, thanks for the opportunity to be here. My name is Monica Collins, and I am a resident of Hancock and the director of a local nonprofit, uh, All Volunteer Feeding the Valley Alliance. We serve the communities of Rochester, Hancock, and Granville by distributing fresh food at no cost to residents in need. Our funding comes from grants and donations mainly. Um, so. I also work at Vermont Law and Graduate School with master's students, helping them find jobs. Um, and many of them focus their work on food and agriculture law and policy. I became involved with the steering committee of the roadmap because it was critical to have representation from small rural organizations and communities given the different challenges that we face. Um, I worked on farms. I'm a former select board chair. I'm a current regional planning commission rep for my community. And I'm also someone who's experienced food insecurity. Um, the focus of my message today though, is that there are existing tools for communities to work with to ensure food access in general and in the context of emergency preparedness and resilience. An example is the Farm to Plate Network's Local Planning for Food Access Toolkit. That was published in 2019. It came out just a couple of months before the pandemic hit. So obviously the focus shifted to that, but now it's 2024. And um, I think it would be very helpful for communities to know that this toolkit exists. Um, so that they can incorporate food access into their town planning. Um, this information will help them keep issues like access to farmland, economic development for local food stores, which is something 
our community has faced when we lost our only um, grocery store um, and emergency management in mind as they update their plans. So where I see the disconnect is that there is often funding available for planning, but that same level of funding is not readily available for implementation. Uh, town plans, hazard mitigation plans, local emergency management plans, those are all wonderful tools that can incorporate food security, but they don't at the moment, um, unless the community specifically works to do that. Um, but smaller communities don't often have dedicated employees to do this work and they can't afford them. They operate mostly through volunteers. And frankly, it's proving very difficult to find people who have the time, the energy, and as the issues increase in complexity, uh, the skills to do all the work that needs to be done on the community level. But you can help us make this work a reality by supporting local decision makers who know their villages and towns, help us with capacity building and funding to empower the participation of local citizens who know their communities. I really believe that this roadmap will lead to food security with your support. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Monica and Joey and Anor. It's been, we just have a great team. I just am like so excited about collaborating with these folks in our coalition. And so now I'm just gonna take some time to give a short overview of the statewide engagement process we use to create the roadmap and then how to read the document itself. So to make the roadmap, um, Farm to Plate Network members, we had about people representing over 120 organizations. Those were joined by UVM researchers, partner organizations from other sectors, and Vermonters who contributed their personal experience with food security. Together, we designed and implemented a statewide community engagement effort to gather the successes and obstacles we experienced in Vermont by Vermonters. So we gathered guidance from people at food shelves, farmers markets, at the hunger councils and other locations, from farmers, professionals and individuals who are building food security for themselves and their communities. A particular effort was made to gather guidance from people who the Department of Health has identified as most impacted by the lack of food security in Vermont. This is people who identify as black, indigenous, or people of color, people who are lesbian, gay, transgender, have other queer identities, people who live rurally, people who live with poverty, and people who live with a disability. So from all this feedback outreach, about 600 people gave their ideas and opinions about how to create food security in Vermont. We worked with a UVM professor who analyzed all the community feedback, and then small groups built the goals and objectives that are within the roadmap out of that feedback. So the organizations testifying today participated in the final writing as Anor shared, but the contents of the roadmap are completely drawn from the statewide feedback. So let's look at the roadmap now, and I will just explain very quickly how it's organized. So you will have a copy, thanks to Jake. And if you turn to page 14 and 15, we just had this printed, so you actually have copies, and I do not have one to hold up. <laughs> I'll be the visual reference. <laughs> Jake, if you can hold up, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I... on page, so, okay, we're on pages 14 and 15. I can see them there. So all the pages before page 14 give more detail on the background of creating the roadmap. So more detail on what I just quickly breezed through there. All the pages after page 15 outline the objectives and strategies that will get us to our three goals and create food security in Vermont by 2035. Then on page 14, you can see there is a graphic that's titled the anatomy of an objective. So that shows you how to read all the pages after page 15. So on the top of the anatomy of, object of the objective, it shows there's the goal area, then the words of the objective itself, 
and then some text that succinctly explains why the objective is important and how it will create food security in the state. Then you can still see on this anatomy of the objective, if you're looking at it, the strategies follow on the right-hand side. And then for each objective and throughout the roadmap, we provided direct quotes from the community feedback across the state that related to those um, topics that are in that spread. Then on page 15, you can see a list of the three goals and all the objectives that are underneath them. So Honor, Joey, and Monica touched on a few of these goal and objective areas that are important to their work and their communities. And we have many more that we're going to achieve together. At this moment, just to get us through our presentation and make sure we have time for questions and whatever details you wanna be talking about more fully, I'm gonna to move to introduce Abby and Stephanie. Um, they have been incredible partners representing the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets and the Department of Health throughout this entire process. <laughs> the state recognized the urgency and need for a shared path to food security in Vermont and provided significant funding and staff support. And our collective action has been successful because the state of Vermont took leadership on food security so we'll start with Abby Willard from the Agency of Agriculture, who's there in the room, and then um, she'll be followed by Stephanie Bergen from the Department of Health, who is on Zoom. Morning, Abby. Good morning. Hi. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Just squeeze right in. <laughs> All right, Abby Willard, Vermont Agency of Agriculture. I'm really excited to see this. Um, roadmap. This is sort of the first time, obviously, we're seeing it in print, and um, it's true, your eyes are really drawn to that um, flood image that Senator Camping was just looking at in Montpelier. You'd be really reminded of how much water came through that watershed and through our communities and, and, and on our farms. Uh, I also look at, like, page nine, that Coleman Farm was kind of continuously shown um, through part of our social media and drone footage of, of the agency. But um, yeah, it's really exciting to see all the, the thoughtfulness and the public perspective kind of captured all the hard work into this, this roadmap here. Um, so yeah, the, the Agency of Agriculture is really excited um, to see the roadmap, very proud of the work and both the, the bold and attainable goal of ending hunger in Vermont by 2035. I'm proud of a state that can um, get behind such an objective. From the agency's perspective, the, the strategies in this roadmap that make that critical link between food security and food production and really elevate the important message that food security depends on viable agricultural sector is really important to us. So I know I think you you would likely agree that we can't talk about community viability without addressing hunger. And we can't talk about supporting families without talking about food production. We can't talk about Vermont's culture without investing in our future farmers. And we really will likely be unlikely to achieve economic viability as a state if we can't find a way to feed ourselves. And we know that that will require viable and productive agriculture and farms. So that's like a heavy responsibility and, and very complex systems that we're act, asking to act in unison. And I think that's where this roadmap is such an accomplishment because it really focuses on providing resilient resources to our communities, to our families, and to our farms. And this inextricable link between ending hunger and supporting viable farms really resonates with the work that we do in the Ag Agency and the Ag Development Division, and what I think we talk about with this committee on a, on a regular basis year after year. And I think as, as Becca mentioned, um, the Agency of Agriculture contributed money out of our fiscal year 23 appropriation, so $150,000, which was also matched with the Department of Health Resources to the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund to launch this roadmap process a few years ago. And as others have spoken and, and Joey attested, and I just want to just 
real heartfelt support for the Footbrook Farm and for Joey and Tony. They were one of the most tragically impacted farms during the July flood and kind of resulting growing season. And not the only farm by any means or any business, but only business, but but devastated with the amount of water that kind of or through their farm and their land. Um, but I think we all have learned that through the COVID experience and through the July flooding event, you know, we talked about the fragility of our food system and the value of local producers to sort of care for one another and provide for community members, um, the importance of having reliable and accessible systems that ensure we can support and feed our communities. So the agency was involved in this roadmap um, process. So as a member of the steering committee representing the Ag Agency, um, you know, we were part of some of the early public engagement efforts and some of the first collection of voices and perspectives from Vermonters, and then throughout the process of developing the strategies. And so you'll see, I think starting on page 32, um, is where, not that the other strategies and um, focus areas aren't critical as well, but starting on page 32 is where the very specific um, agricultural strategies begin under the kind of the focus area of Vermont farms having the resources to be resilient. Uh, and so the agency played a role in helping design and kind of guide, um, <clears throat> along with many other voices, the focus area of these four areas and the, the 12 resultant strategies. And yet the strategies in this plan are not wholly new. So you'll see a lot of, and probably become, be familiar with a lot of the recommendations and language in here that were previously highlighted in the Climate Action Plan, were included in strategies and recommendations in the future of Ag Commission reports that have been submitted over the past few years, and provide you know, further detail from what was outlined in the Vermont Ag and Food System Strategic Plan, also led by the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund support for the Agency of Agriculture. I think collectively what all of those efforts and all of those strategies and plans outline is the policy choices that we need to make to ensure that farms have the resources to be resilient and the focus on viable solutions to really ensure that, that everyone in Vermont has the food that they need. So they feel like, they sound like basic goals, and I think we all know how complex they are and, and the consequences of trying to achieve that goal. Or I shall say, to achieve that goal, since that is that is what will happen by 2035, I'm sure. Your sure, master, quick push. Yeah. Not until after. Sorry to interrupt. That's okay. Is what, but can you just remind me what percentage? And I'm sure it was mentioned when I I came in late. I apologize. Okay. Um, are we trying to? Are, trying to get you in terms of the number of people that are hungry, that are food insecure. We have that. Like the actual number of the average average percentage, will be percentage. Huge. Yeah. Where we are now versus where we'll be in 2035. I mean, I think the goal, yeah. the vision is that there will, the hunger would be eliminated by 2033. Well, what does that look like? How many people? Yeah. I don't know that I, I know that. Where are you right now, right? Is it percent now or it's food insecure? I think someone else in the room might be okay. better prepared to offer that. So what that. percentage of people are food insecure right now? Anybody know? I mean, I, I'm sure it's a moving number. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so based on the most recent data that we have from researchers at UVM, which yeah. which is more recent than the USDA data we often use, over the course of the last 12 months, two in five people. So that is where that 40 percent comes from. Have um, experienced. Food insecurity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Yeah, I, I appreciate that kind of just like putting in context how many families and children and individuals are talking about. Yeah, yeah, 40%. So there's strategies in this plan from the agricultural perspective uh, or in this roadmap that address the supply chain infrastructure development efforts that we've been collectively working on. And this, this committee has supported with resources for the Working Lands Program, for the Ag Development Grants for Meat, Maple, and Produce, and are also supported through the new Resilient Food System Infrastructure Federal Resources that Vermont received. That's the 4.5 million 
to focus on that middle of the supply chain. So looking at aggregation and storage and distribution and processing solutions. There are strategies in this roadmap <clears throat> that address land access models that are really gonna require some more focused and creative attention to how we wanna conserve and access agricultural lands. And this feels like a really pivotal time to be thinking about that as we see the pressure mounting around how open and access, ag accessible land can be used for either food production and or for housing and development. So the agency is engaged in a project to catalog and quantify the Act 250 on-site mitigation parcels and ensure that those are engaged in active agricultural production, as well as other efforts. There's also strategies in this roadmap that highlight the appreciation for farmers and agriculture for their wise use of our natural resources and their stewardship of our land and their active management of our land. So the agency, along with many partners through the Payment for Ecosystem Services working group, working group created the Vermont Farmer Ecosystem Service Stewardship Program. And that program sort of provides payments to farmers that recognizes and compensates them for their whole farm benefits and stewardship that's building upon a federal program within NRCS called the Conservation Stewardship Program. So my last comment before I, before I hand it off to the next would be just you know sharing with you how committed our agency is to ensuring that the strategies outlined in this roadmap are achieved that invest in agriculture, that support economic viability, that ensure our families, community, and farms collectively have the resources they all need to be resilient. So in advance, thank you for, for your support and enjoy reading the roadmap. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah. I think it's Stephanie, who's hopefully online. That's Stephanie. Oh, good. There she is. Good morning. And it's a pleasure to virtually be with you today. Um, I'm Stephanie Bergen, and I live in Colchester, and I'm a registered dietitian with the Vermont Department of Health's Division of Health Promotion and Disease Prevention. The Department of Health has been a proud partner on this roadmap from the start helping to launch the roadmap's development with $125,000 of CDC COVID health disparities funds, because we recognize that food security is imperative for human health and development, as well as chronic disease prevalence. Our research shows that food security has a significant impact on quality of life, including physical health, mental health, and social emotional support. We also know that food security disproportionately impacts members of our community or I'm sorry, not having access to food disproportionately impacts members of our community. And as Becca previously mentioned, this includes our BIPOC and LGBTQIA plus communities, as well as Vermonters living with a disability have a harder time putting food on the table. Examples of the Department of Health's work as it pertains to the roadmap and food security generally include administering direct service programs like You First and the well-known Women, Infants and Children Program or WIC program, that serves 7,000 families across the state and provides nutrition education, nourishing food, breastfeeding support, and healthcare referrals. Additionally, SNAP Ed funds and our healthy community design work supports organizations and municipalities across the state to enhance consistent, dignified access to nourishing, adequate, and culturally responsive food today and in the future. This roadmap is so impactful and exciting in part because it brings all of the elements of our food system together to elevate a crucial need. And that's Vermonters having enough food. And not just having enough food, but having nourishing and culturally appropriate food to thrive. The, the Department of Health supports the Roadmap's comprehensive strategies to achieving food security, all of which are derived from the voices of people living in Vermont, and many of which are already underway. We are grateful for the opportunity to speak with you today, bringing to life the public and private collaboration that made this roadmap possible. And thank you so much for your time. And I believe I turn it back to Becca. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you, Abby. So we're all just pretty much done with our prepared testimony and just want to say this roadmap is here to guide you and all of us in making policy decisions to ensure that all people in Vermont have the food they need at all times in all the circumstances that we are facing. And all of us here today and our coalition partners who are watching on YouTube um, are committed to the actions recommended by this roadmap and committed to working with you. We 
The Roadmap Coalition will continue to be housed within the Farm to Plate Network and staffed by the Jobs Fund. We are already on the road to food security, as Anor said, and with your leadership, we know our collective impact will be successful. And I just want to personally thank you for the opportunity that I've had to work with these collaborators and with people statewide to develop this roadmap. It's been truly an amazing process and uh, very moving to hear input from people across the state. And I, of course, really appreciate the opportunity to share it with you today. And we are ready for questions. Thank you so much for uh, <laughs> helping us carry on to the end of our <laughs> our testimony. Yeah, well, thank you, uh, Becca. And uh, we'll uh, move on to questions. Um, I think one question that Brian uh, asked, uh, you know, how many people are we actually mm -hmm. talking about? And we get, you know, we got the statistics of about two and five. Um, <clears throat> what does that translate into numbers? Is that, <clears throat> um, so that's less than, if we've got 600 and say 600,000 people in Vermont, um, half would be 300,000, we're under that, so would it, would it be as many as 200,000? Is, is that number realistic? I think, um, Mr. Chair, that Anor and, um, is able to address more closely, as she did earlier, than the data that we currently have, and one issue that we have identified as an early need in this roadmap work is to consolidate and think deeply about what kind of data we want to be gathering to answer this question. We are very fortunate to have a team of UVM researchers who are working on food security research in the state. And the data that Anor was able to share comes from that project. There is also some federal research and then methods, my very amateur understanding is the methodology there differs. And so that is one reason why we're never quite sure what the numbers are. So in order for us to really make decisions and measure our progress and celebrate our successes, we will need to work with existing researchers and perhaps, perhaps think about what data we wanna be measuring in order to move toward our vision. Anor, I'm wondering if you have anything to add since you're more familiar with the um, the sort of research on quantitative hunger and food security in the state. Um, yes, and and uh, and John Sales is also here. So the Vermont Food Bank is also a member of the Food Security Roadmap Coalition. So I hope John will jump in also. But so one thing that makes all of this very tricky is that people move in and out of food security. You know, we are a lot of people in our state who are seasonally employed. There are um, people who may be just getting by and the flooding in the summer that we experienced put them over the edge uh, temporarily, perhaps, we hope, into um, losing their food security. So it's, it is challenging to have a stable number. And I think that if we're really going to bring, as we're committed to doing, food security to zero, in uh, or, or hunger to zero, and food security to 100% in our state in 10 years, then we have to build systems that really reach folks who are on the edge and going in and out of experiencing hunger. Um, and there's many, many folks in that situation in, in our state. And that is why the best data that we have right now is that at some point over a, a 12 month period, this household has reported experiencing hunger. 
but they might not be experiencing that at this particular moment, or they might not have been experiencing that nine months ago. And so, um, you know, one one recommendation, one priority recommendation um, in in the food security roadmap is actually to really to create an office of food security in our state government that would over that would help to coordinate and oversee this kind of data gathering and determining what kind of data needs to be gathered mm -hmm. and also to make sure that all state agencies and the legislature are talking to each other about food security and um, all the different programs housed in all the different agencies that contribute to food security are communicating with each other and are all easily accessed through the same easy one door mm -hmm. access for people. And that that would also be a place um, where um, emergency food response, you know, could be better coordinated. Um, Hunger Free Vermont partnered with the SEOC during the uh, aftermath of this summer's flooding to try to help figure out where were prepared meals needed in this Washington County region that was so hard hit. And what we really realized is that individual towns weren't collecting information about who needed emergency food support in their communities. They didn't have that written into their emergency town plans. It's not actually part of the template that towns are provided. And and nobody really like realized that until until its absence was very serious and very detrimental. And so it's things like that that um, that that have to get better coordinated. All of us we have to better coordinate that at the state level to make sure that um, we know we know what we're talking about and who we're talking about and and what how to implement in the best possible way these um these the programs that we already have and new programs we might need to start to to really reach everybody but that that last suggestion like adding uh food or hunger to the town uh emergency plans um uh, I should think that would be a pretty simple thing and an uncostly thing to do. Um, we had John in last week, I guess it was, and and it, from what I gathered from your testimony is that you supply food to all the individual like food banks throughout the state and. Yeah, you know, like in in my area, in the Northeast Kingdom, we have uh, several distribution points where people can go and get food. And, you know, we're at the end of the world where we are. Um, so I would, I assume from that that other counties um, had similar outlets for food. And I don't know if you wanted to comment again on that, John, to reassure us how many distribution points you had? Sure. Uh, for the record, John Sales. I'm the CEO of the Vermont Food Bank. And I just want to second everything Adore said and point out it's actually page 21 of the, the written plan there, the strategies under G3, which include the Office of Food and Nutrition Security and also developing and maintaining a data system so that we can have better information um, so to answer your question, Senator Starr, the Food Bank uh, works with uh, about 300 uh, community-based groups all around the state. So food shelves, meal sites, out-of-school programs, senior centers, homeless shelters, basically anyone who, who distributes or who, who feeds people and works with, uh, with folks in crisis or in very low incomes. Uh, we also, as the food bank, do direct distribution programs or Veggie Van Gogh and, and distribution to SASH sites, which I've talked about before. Um, it's And it's really challenging. You know, we talk about all those partners that we have. Um, 
we are actually working with our national organization, Feeding America, to develop uh, data gathering systems. Um, and there are tools out there that we're starting to implement. Of course, it takes resources to set those systems up. We have to set up our, you know, the, um, you know, the, the folks at NACA Northeast Community, Community Action. So they have a food shelf that they run in Cayman. Um, and so they would need to have, you know, a tablet and the people who come into the food shelf would have a swipe card. And, and so we'd be able to, um, to have some real time data. Um, but we have to be able to get all that technology to the people, train them to use it and make sure it gets used and that the data gets downloaded. Um, I, I think one of the other data challenges is that it's, it's the agency of human services that owns all the information about people and their income level and the services that they're getting access to. And I know that Hunger Free Vermont works very closely with DCF and AHS, and yet we as nonprofits can't access a lot of that information. Um, and AHS doesn't have the capacity or the systems in place to be able to crunch that data in a way that gives us a better idea of, of our food insecurity numbers or our the, the folks who, who need some more help with food in Vermont. So I think the roadmap is going to help us have a, 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 a vision of where we want to get by 2035. And hopefully we can start now taking steps to get there. Yeah, I mean, it, that seems like a long ways away. Well, well, we can do it quicker. I, we can do it quicker. <laughs> that would be fine. Well, I mean, I guess, you know, I look at it as definitely uh, coming from a very rural area. It, you know, if you've got somebody in your community that like in food, you take them so, yeah. you know, yeah. Whereas in cities or in communities where people don't know everyone, uh, people could get very hungry real quick. Yeah. Um, the uh, yeah, I I was trying to think through, you know, the different steps and and <laughs> step one. I mean, it's how you set up your steps is determines how long it takes you to get to the end. And uh, the, uh, you know, it's critical that that we address this. I mean, it's, it, it's really sad to think that somebody has to go to bed hungry. And, uh, you know, just last week I was over gassing up at the uh, local uh, gas station and you know all of them just pumping the gas and standing there and this guy comes up hey buddy uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't have a dollar or so so I could it was a cold night so I could go in and get a cup of coffee and uh you know so there are people out there and uh uh you know, I told him, I, <laughs> I said, well, you know, I haven't gained all of this. I got a five with that word. <laughs> and and uh, so hopefully he went and got something to eat with his coffee. But uh, uh, I, and I didn't have any single bills. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, so there, you know, he's probably one of, 50 here in the city that uh, that was having trouble. Uh, but, uh, yeah, now the agencies um, but, uh, help and do you have some money in your budget to push your part of this along or is it something that that we need to do with legislators to try to get it into the budget? Well, the budget address was yesterday, so so you know the agency supports the governor's budget. Um, we didn't hear a damn word about under in there. Maybe I maybe I missed it. I mean, I think there's strategies in here that address infrastructure investment for food security and for food production. 
So we have some resources. So, yeah. you know, really we're focusing on implementing the programs from the resources that we've received in fiscal year 24. So that's the meat maple and produce grants, which are really about how do we get resiliency in those diversified agricultural sectors. We have the good fortune of, you know, ARPA dollars for the working lands program. So the working lands program just received $10 million in demand for the 2 million that they're going to put out. And just we're like the, the demand and the idea of wanting to support vibrant and, and viable agriculture still is at an all time high in Vermont. And then we have the opportunity of these additional federal resources that will focus on the supply chain. So helping businesses, you know, access markets outside of Vermont, which is around business viability, not necessarily solely about feeding Vermonters, but it can help businesses be more viable so that they can do both. They can both expand to reach new markets, new customers, and be able to be kind of community focused in, in some of their food production. Um, I think I'll, uh, we can speak more about the demand that we're receiving, but certainly the demand is out stripping the resources that we have available. Yeah. Working lands and the grants program. Yeah. Do you have quite a few grant programs that yeah, we do. And we have been fortunate to have both federal, federal and state resources. Um, you know, the fiscal year budget for 25 will be, you know, level funded based upon, you know, base allocations for previous years. Yeah, there's a three and a half percent. I think that uh, we're talking about available funds. Yeah. Um, not, not a lot. John? Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to point out that the you, know, you mentioned neighbors helping neighbors, that that is happening in Vermont. Uh, the Vermont Food Bank alone raised $9 million in philanthropy for our operations last year. That doesn't include what Hunger Free Vermont has raised. And as, uh, as Maura said, each of our partners are out there raising money in their communities. Um, and so it's, you know, well over $10 million. Um, just that I could put my finger on right now. And that's not including the ag sector. So the, you know, people of Vermont are very generous and they are stepping up uh, to help their neighbors. And I think this plan is how do we coordinate that with a, um, a, a state government effort to really take us to a goal? Yeah. Uh, I think, yes, uh, I think um, Monica <clears throat> might be able to really speak speak to that the 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 relationship between uh kind of these steps that can be taken um and then but what communities might need to actually implement that yeah did you want to chime in monica yes please thank you um so town plans are a great way to incorporate food access planning and not just for um, emergency situations, but also long term, because food access is not just food insecurity, but it's also do you have a viable grocery store in your community? Do you have do local are local farms able to sell their produce, their 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 meat, dairy in the town they live in? Um, so. Strengthening those local food systems is really key to having resilient communities. But my um, my concern is that there's already a funding available for towns to put together their um, town plans, and having that information about food access. Uh, and and how to incorporate it into a town plan is important. But then the piece that I always found was missing when I was on the select board was that there's no assistance either in training, capacity building, or um, or just implementation funds for after that plan is put together. So there's all these amazing plans sitting on the shelf and some com communities, some communities have the resources to do that work. Others, like my community, we have 350-ish people, and it's an all-volunteer select board. We get 
I think I got paid more like $1,200 a year. And when you break that down by the hour, it's pennies. Um, and it's almost a full-time job um, in addition to my own full-time job. So <clears throat> there's difficulty in having people who know how to do this work and who have the time and capacity to do it. So that is something that you really need to think about when um, talking about planning as a mechanism to help this is that there needs to be that next step as well. Um, in my community, we have um, just anecdotally, I don't have hard data, but I can tell you that we have been serving um, we do once a month distributions of Veggie Van Gogh um, bags, and we have had 35 families on the average um, who have been accessing our services from Hancock, Granville, Rochester, and sometimes Stockbridge, Pittsfield, and Goshen. And, um, and that's 35 families, not 35 individuals. Uh, for November and December, that shot up to 57. And on Friday, we will be distributing to 42 families. Most of these are folks who are working folks or seniors who just have a hard time making that social security check stretch out for the whole month. Thank you. Also pretty telling numbers for that little valley um, that you live in, that's for sure. Uh, other questions? Uh, the, uh, I was wondering, um, we're on our third, I think, year with free school meals. Is this the third year or third? Mm -hmm. Because not even the pandemic, I think it's the Fourth, counting that. And I know uh, and maybe some of your folks know better than I have heard that um, schools have implemented uh, like a pantry type deal that um, after hot lunch is over, uh, food that's left uh, from the hot lunch is put on in containers and on uh, a rack where the hot lunch is and as kids, uh, children leave uh, school in the afternoon, they can pick up food from that. Uh, and I'm wondering if that has helped to reduce hunger amongst our youngest citizens of the state with having uh, universal meals. Because both uh, Senator Collimore and his committee and our committee, uh, the two of us, uh, two committees played a pretty key role in pushing uh, the universal school meals. And, you know, when I go to meetings, uh, usually a parent will mention that if it's not a school meeting, and if it's a school meeting, you know, you hear it from the teachers as well as uh, the administrators, uh, how well that that is all working. So do, do you have any numbers on, on uh, if that reduced our hunger numbers and <clears throat> Do many, and do you know many schools have a like a take home program from from the hot lunch program? Yes. Well, um, yes. So absolutely, this this committee and and Senate Education without without you all, we wouldn't be in this really exciting place that we are today with permanent universal school meals. It is a program that has been very well implemented by our agency of education. And we have also heard from, from teachers and, and others that it's really been a game changer for them in terms of um, student health and student ability to focus and student mental and emotional 
well-being during these really challenging years. Um, we don't have, I don't have data to say universal school meals has reduced hunger for children or families by a certain specific amount. Um, I think when you look at what happened in Vermont with um, child hunger compared to other states nationally, especially when a lot of the economic supports for families like the expanded child tax credit at the federal level, the expanded SNAP benefits at the federal level went away and, and all across the country, child hunger spiked by 20 percentage points in some states. And while those, the end of those programs was also, also caused increased hunger for families in Vermont, we did not see that dramatic spike in our child hunger numbers. And that is because of universal school meals and the other um, programs like summer meals and after school meals that that we have um, and also enhance support mm -hmm. to child care providers um, that helped to support children's nutrition um, and and I you know also and I I would love us to do more studies on this but we know that children are in families and you can't, you know, it's a whole family system. And when families are not having to spend the money to purchase the food they need to make lunches and breakfasts for their children five days a week, or they're not having to put, to spend that money um, to pay for school meals, school breakfasts and lunches, that is additional money that those families can deploy to create better food security for everybody in that family at home. And we know that that's how, that's how household economics works. I mean, that's how my household economics works and that's how your household economics works and that's how it works for everybody in Vermont. And so absolutely the Universal School Meals Program is a, a key piece of tackling um, hunger in Vermont and ensuring food security for everyone. Um, and then in terms of your question about how are schools addressing food that kids are not eating? Um, so of course there's a lot of health and safety concerns, which once food has been, you know, cooked in a, you know, you got a big tin of lasagna, you have to be really careful about what you do with those leftovers. You can't just leave them sitting out all day for kids to take. That's just not really safe. But there are components of the meal, like, you know, whole pieces of fruit or, um, you know, things that are in a, in a, you know, wrapped up in something that can be put on uh, a sharing table for other kids to take. And that happens in many, many of our schools. And then also our school nutrition professionals are experts at how you don't waste that extra cooked food. So they will they turn those uh, ingredients into part of the next day's meal. Um, and I do think that there are schools that, you know, one thing I think we learned in in the flooding um, disaster this summer is that is that schools can also be better integrated as places where food can be prepared for people who lose the ability to do that in their homes because they their kitchen flooded out. And that's another part of the coordinated coordination that we could be better at uh, that would really make a difference for us in, in times of crisis. So I don't think I totally gave you the answer you were looking for, but I hope I gave you some of what you were looking for. Yeah, you, you did well. I'm sure the barn full of hay. Thank you. No, it, uh, you know, it's important uh, to this committee and Brian's committee that we try to take care of our children and and our less fortunate. And, uh, and just this morning prior to this meeting, I was meeting with... Uh, folks from the Hannaford store company out of Maine. 
in regards to food, uh, New England's food security and, you know, whether they would buy products from our Vermont farms if, if we convert to, you know, whatever vegetables. And, and uh, it was, uh, that was a, a good, a good meeting. And, you know, they're, they're really uh, getting geared up to buy local. Mm -hmm. And right. uh, so uh, they were going to meet with Hanson later yeah. this morning. And so uh, the only thing I didn't get to ask them was what, what do they do with their food that's near outdated or is outdated? Uh, because that, that could be utilized, I think. John, you mentioned that you get food the other day when you were yeah the food bank we we have relationship with Hannaford and with all the other grocery stores in Vermont Shaw's and Price Chopper and the the independents and co-ops and either the food bank itself or one of our partners um, a food shelf or meal site uh, will go and several times a week and pick up whatever gets called at the store if there's dead cans if there's dairy that's close to code if there's produce that's that's coming off the shelves. Um, so as much as possible of that um, does go into the charitable food system already. We have a great relationship with Hannaford um, yeah. and the, all the other the other chains in Vermont. Yeah, um, it, I I was uh, pleasantly surprised with you know they came down from Maine mm -hmm. and uh, so they had you know they came down yesterday and had to stay over because it was an early meeting. Uh, no, and uh, so that, that's good. Are there other questions? Uh, oh, that was very helpful. Anything else from any of you folks that you want to offer? Uh, we've, you know, we've taken quite a lot of testimony this early in the session. It's kind of unusual, really, to get, you know, to take as much as we have in regards to uh, food security uh, and uh, you know the New England feeding New England issue uh, food bank uh, and uh, so as uh, as we move forward uh, we'll be Richie uh, Senator Westman and I are also on appropriations uh, so we'll uh, be in there scratching for, for every dime we can get if there's any any around. And uh, uh, we usually do okay. Better start, really. Ellen's better. I, on that very point, uh, Ellen Kaler from Ross Samuel Johnson, I was just wondering, do you think that the Senate Appropriations Committee would <clears throat> be open to having an abbreviated presentation about the roadmap, given how many, like over the long term, how much we are looking to the state to be a major partner in this? Is that something that that the, I, the committee might be open to? I don't know. I I think I would, I would speak with the chair about that. I mean, I think you should. We could mentioned but we don't do a I lot of testimony um, generally on the vote for the policy committees to wait uh, and then get recommendations from us on advocacy day i don't see why you couldn't do a little spiel there yeah i think you know you had the advocacy days but that ends up being three minutes thirty minutes so yeah it's it, and i would Suggest that uh, write something succinctly and um, and send it to the committee, and it will go in the list of requests. Yeah, that yeah we don't we don't usually hear from uh, like like yeah. we do in here. We don't uh, really get in. Not uh, Jane or you know there is a trash and document in joint fiscal teams. Yeah. And so if there's um, a succinct um, document that comes from the group, it will be included in, in 
and they'll make that measure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm wondering if anybody has seen the town successfully put for resilience and security in the town plans, the towns that I had that are rural um, are mostly, I think, focused on development. Um, seeing that tax revenue that seems so attractive and forgetting that they'll provide services to any extra people that go to town. Um, I guess much better use of our land, but that's me and I don't know how I as one resident um, or even a non-resident in other towns in my district could successfully sell this idea. Yeah. Do you have experience yeah. doing that in towns or is this sort of a new concept that is going to take a while to infiltrate into town planning missions? Yeah, I'm not thinking of an example town okay. right now. Not if we want to but, spot, but, yeah, but, but if anybody wants to get back to me with a strategy or you yeah, know, if anybody maybe. wants to come yeah. talk to planning yeah. commissions, I think that would be a great way to mm -hmm. yeah. tell them it's not just residents, it's a statewide issue that mm -hmm. they need to do. I, I can I can talk to that a little bit. I'm sorry, I can't see the people in the room. So am I interrupting someone? No. No. Okay, no. good. Um, I mean, I can't see the, I can see all of you senators, um, but not the others who might be speaking. Um, Chris Campion, who is the director of the Wyndham Regional Commission, has been very involved in this project. And I think he would be an excellent person um, who would really enjoy coming to answer that question for you, Senator. Um, as Monica has testified, she has been involved, the local, her local bodies that work on planning. And so she has some localized knowledge. <laughs> and we do have this toolkit that we referenced that Farm to Plate did create with in coordination with the Regional Planning Commission collaborators. Um, but the pandemic did really uh, stop the planned rollout of that project. A lot of towns are doing work you know, you would in many cases know better than I that relate to resilience about waste. It's often about wastewater is my understanding. Um, and then, you know, development planning in other ways. But I think Chris would know um, more details and uh, I can reach out to him. Great. I mean, one kind of related piece that I'm thinking about would be um, towns that have engaged in developing bylaws around accessory on farm business designations. So I feel like that's not, you know, maybe specifically around food and access in the kind of like maybe the most direct way that you may be thinking about it, but encouraging communities to help farm businesses be able to offer farm stands that carry product from other businesses or encouraging um, you know, more of that value added processing to make, you know, different food types available within their community could be part of, and, and we are seeing towns that have developed, you know, specific bylaws in support of that um, Act 143 accessory on farm business designation. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was just gonna, uh, so Jay Claro from a stable job. So I'm just another person is uh, Seth Jensen who's at uh, Lamoille's regional, he's at the Lamoille Regional Planning Commission, um, and they've done a lot of work around accessory mm -hmm. on farm businesses, but also just really, I think, creative um, you know, regional and town planning that's oriented towards food systems, working landscapes that might you know, have some specific examples. Anything else, Maybe. No. Any other guests have anything else? I just want to say thank you. And we're very much looking forward to continuing our collaboration and yeah. creating food security for our for our neighbors by 2035. I hope we get there. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thanks thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No. Um, um, yeah. Well, we have our uh, right committee. Yeah. 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 Ye
He's still on the stage. So he's yeah. coming in yeah. years. A little while. So, you know, if you need to uh, take a little break. Uh, Where is Michael? Yeah, Can Michael come over the room? I don't know. Uh, oh, check and see if I don't know. He's going to come at the room. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The other day. Yeah. Or cut. Get us out. Okay. In 15 uh, minutes, then we could get us out. Yeah. Yeah. So that was as soon as. Is that the house bill coming to us, or is that our bill? Okay. Uh, I thought. So we are going to take a little break. Yeah. Check back in 15. Yeah. I'll come here.